All right, gentlemen, take your seats. Let's get this over before lunch. Flight Rose of the Homicide Squad has decided to take early retirement. We will all miss Floyd and the steely edge he brought to his police work. The department has arranged a wee drink at the Galway Arms to quench the mighty thirst a man gets from 25 years of police work. Floyd's departure leaves a place at the top table, and the chief has seen fit to promote Cole Phelps from burglary to the homicide desk. Stand up, Phelps. Take a chair. You're in the major leagues now, Sonny. Rusty Galloway, a fine lawman of the old school, will be taking you under his wing. Your first case is the murder of a woman, found last night and bearing all the signs of the werewolf. Get out to the scene, lads. Do you have the address? It's been all over KGPL. Herman. It's off Temple Street, between Belmont Glendale. and Glendale. I'd rather you took the wheel. Despite how Rusty Galloway feels about driving, I don't like driving either, so we'll let him take the wheel. What happened to Rose? Parker wants the chief's job. Word is it's either going to be him or Thad Green. So they're both clearing the decks. So where does that leave you, Galloway? Leaves me saddled with a chump like you, Phelps. I didn't ask for you, and I don't want you, so keep it to yourself. See if you can learn something about seeing how a real cop operates. What did he mean by the werewolf? Medallion. The Daily News came out calling him the werewolf killer. The examiner came up with the black dahlia. Were any closer to catching him? Not a chance. Six months and hundreds of guys running down leads and we got nothing. You don't think this has anything to do with it? No, I don't. Ninety percent of murders are domestic, Phelps. Some guy gets into a beef with his wife, he takes it too far. This will be the same. But cutting someone in half and leaving them off the sidewalk, that's a one-off. Why so many women this year? Because of the war. You should know that. Guy gets to kill people every day in combat. Comes home, he's expected to take lip from his wife. What do you think's gonna happen? It's that simple. Like I said, most of the time it is. Galloway went over a lot there. Floyd Rose was the detective Cole Phelps met in his very first patrol case. He was Galloway's partner at that time, a brusque man who just wanted to get back to the bar. Now, Detectives Green and Parker we never meet in the game, but Galloway here tells us that they're both gunning for the chief's job. Now, Rose left for early retirement. Anyone who has watched Keeping Up Appearances will realize that early retirement is not something you choose to take, but rather is something you're forced into. It may be that Floyd Rose was a serious contender for the chief's job, and so Detectives Green and Parker conspire to force him into early retirement so as to clear the decks, as Galloway said here, to remove their own competition. Now, Galloway talked briefly about the Dahlia. We first heard about the Dahlia killer in a previous episode. In our world, there really was a Dahlia killer called the Black Dahlia Killer, infamous for the murder of a young woman named Elizabeth Short. This crime has yet to be solved. Short's body was found naked and dismembered in a field. But the Black Dahlia stopped there. However, in the world of L.A. Noir, the Dahlia continued to murder. Homicide has been plagued by the media trying to cover his salacious murders, and they're eager to put him behind bars. Because so many good cops have been working on the Dahlia case with no success, Galloway has sort of given up. He doesn't think it's going to be solved. And the presence of our intrepid Cole, who asks all the right questions, does nothing but annoy Rusty Galloway. We arrive at the crime scene at 9.28 a.m., and the media vultures are already here, snapping pictures of a poor murdered woman. How about a scoop for the examiner, Galloway? You could use some good press. Another tramp, another message. Is the werewolf back in business, boys? Do you have a mother, asshole? A sister? How about showing some respect for this poor woman? Let us do our job, and Detective Galloway will give you a statement later. He's good, Rusty. He even sounds genuine. That's Phelps, guys. The war hero. Defending the honor of murdered humps. You're used to it, Phelps. Move it along, guys. You got your pictures, you got your headlines. Now scram! Phelps and Galloway walk onto the green, where they follow a trail of blood and footprints leading to the corpse of a woman stripped completely naked with markings on her stomach. As he approaches, Cole addresses the patrolman. Patrolman, this your beat? 
Yes, sir. Well, part of it. Kids park here. They use it like a lover's lane. It's a working neighborhood. Some trouble, but nothing like this. It's uh, known locally as the Moors. You were first on the scene? Yes, detective. No one's disturbed the body? No, sir. We cleared out them vulture reporters so Pinker and the coroner could work. They're waiting to talk to you. Go house to house and see what you come up with. We find Carruthers already at the scene. Carruthers? Phelps? You make homicide? Looks like it. Galloway has been making me feel welcome. I bet he has. Has the scene been secured? Patrolman Houlihan saw to it. The victim's personal effects are still where they fell. Examining the corpse. Cause of death? It could be the head injuries. She has been badly stomped. The cuts look superficial. I'll, I'll know for sure in an hour. Taking a look at the head. What caused the blunt force injury to the face? Could be anything from a baseball bat to a lug wrench. I'll have more details after the autopsy. On her belly, we find a message. Hmm. Interesting. F-U-B-D. Tex. Moving to her right hand, we don't see anything. Moving to her left hand, however... What about this wound on the finger? Something removed. A ring, most likely. I assume it was taken post-mortem. But it's on her middle finger, so it couldn't have been a wedding band. We see footprints on her chest. Not only was she stricken in the head, but she's been stomped upon. What's the writing on the victim mean? BD, Black Dahlia, Tex. Your guess is as good as mine. Could be something to it, or it could be the killers trying to throw you off the scent. Either way, I'll run tests on the lipstick. Any idea of the time of death? From the temperature, I'd say after midnight. I'll confirm with you later. Moving away from the body, we can examine evidence at evidence marker B. These appear to be footprints, and one has been cast. What can you tell me about the shoe prints? Men's size eights. Pinker lifted impressions for me to compare back at the lab. As we find no other footprints here, we can presume that these are the footprints of the murderer. He wore a size eight shoe. Moving to evidence marker A, we find some of the woman's belongings. A brush that has no real significance. And her purse. The victim's bag? Inside, we find some lipstick. Looks brand new. Can't be the one used on the body. But it hasn't been used. To account for the message on her belly, we have to find a blunt tube of lipstick. But we can note the brand name here. Classic Carmine. Finally, we can move towards evidence marker C. Looks like some kind of puzzle or parlor game. And it looks like a globe that has been turned into a bit of a puzzle. But it's fairly simple. We just have to align the continents until... Bomba Club. Why steal a table lighter? So the murder victim, or the murderer, had stolen a lighter from a nearby club. Well, at least we have an address. And that gives us a place to visit next. Can we get to the Bomba? Man could die of thirst on a case like this. Galloway agrees. Leaving the crime scene, we can head to Galloway's patrol car and make our way to the Bomba. The werewolf? For my money, a copycat. We can't rule it out. We need to work the evidence. <laughs> You'd love that, wouldn't you? A big head to hang on your wall. The caller of the decade. You've been working evidence from BD case for six months and got nicks. There's a difference, Rusty. Oh, yeah? I just started working it today. Okay, odd shot. What's more likely? The werewolf comes back around, leaving us unknown in a corpse? He clearly has a thing for power. Power over women. Why not power over the police department as well? Let me finish, Phelps. A guy opens his mouth again after six months of stooping. Or some opportunist who's been reading about the BD figures, he'll rip off the M.O. and get himself a freebie. That's not totally fantastical. Well, the examiner of the Daily News might be good at coming up with monikers, but they're terrible for police work. If there's a reason we didn't get the son of a bitch after the short murder, it was them, locusts. Where do you think the werewolf killer is now? Uh, dead by his own hand, stationed somewhere else with the armed forces. San Quentin, another town, another country, who knows? So, Phelps, I understand you want to turn this into a big case, but it doesn't work like that, all right? A case will come and find you. 
can't make it something it ain't. Understand? So you don't think the werewolf has continued to operate in the Los Angeles area? No chance. You would have found it. Galloway has a lot of faith in his department, but this kind of pride can only lead to mistakes. Mistakes that lead to the harm of the citizens of Los Angeles. Cole and Galloway arrive at the Bomba Club at 9.50 in the morning, and despite the early hours, the place is hopping. Gentlemen, what can I get you? Phelps and Galloway, LAPD. Were you working here last night? Yes. How can I help, officer? You can start with your name. Garrett Mason. You're the regular bartender on nights? I'm a temporary barman. I work for an agency. I fill in at bars across town. Do you remember a woman who came in here last night? Uh, five feet seven, about 110 pounds, blonde hair, about 40 years of age. You mean Celine Henry? Yes. Do you know anything about her? I don't. But the owner, Mr. McCall, serves her most nights. Would you like to speak to him? I would. He sits at the back of the club. Where's a hibiscus? You can't miss it. Is there anything else? Fire away, Phelps. I'll stay here. I'm a little parched. Pour me three fingers of rye. Well, Mason sure is a smug little twerp, but he doesn't appear to have the information we need. And Galloway sure isn't helping, using the opportunity to wet his whistle. That's fine. He'd likely get in the way anyway. Detective Phelps, LAPD. We're investigating the murder of Celine Henry. Do you know her? Celine? Going to pay for that? Oh, Christ. Sure, I know her. She and I and Jacob, her husband, we go way back. She was here last night? Sure, she's a regular. Selene is... was a lovely woman. Ooh, already we're starting to sense something from this man. Did that look like the remorse of a man who just thought of her as a customer? Or perhaps he had a more familiar relationship with this married woman. We can start by asking him if he saw her here with anyone else. Was Mrs. Henry here with anyone last night? Not at first. Celine already had quite a head start. But she attracted attention? Certainly. A few gentlemen became very enamored with her and her stories. One guy in particular. So, Celine attracted the attention of a number of men, one man in particular. At this point, we now have to decide whether or not this man is lying, and we have no reason to doubt that he is telling the truth. He leaned back in his seat, arms folded in his lap, and he's keeping eye contact with Cole Phelps. He is not giving us any indication that he is lying. This man is telling the truth. And so we'll play the good cop to encourage him to tell us more. You know him? No. He's been in a couple of times. Did they leave together? Yes, at around 11. If it helps, I made the guy's license plate. A waitress. Can I have another spoon? Where's that goddamn waitress? I think this could be a great help, sir. Thank you. And the good cop is rewarded to be 88.99. This is exactly what we need. We can run this by R and I before we leave. Next, we'll talk with McCall about the stolen ring. Remember, we found that marking on her middle finger. Mrs. Henry appeared to be missing a ring, torn from her finger, but not her wedding finger. Celine always wore a red garnet ring on the large side, larger than life, like. Celine herself. Did she have it a long time? Sure. Since way back in her flying days. Did her husband buy it for her? No, it was uh, it was before Jacob. Flying days? Oh, she was a pilot. And she's had it for a long time. And McCall here knows she's had it for a long time. Which means he knew her back when she was flying. So she's not just another patron of his bar. They have history. And talking about this ring has clearly made him uncomfortable. Gone is his steady gaze, meeting eyes with Cole Phelps. His eyes now dart around the room. He's fidgeting in his seat. He's predominantly gazing down. He's hiding something. So? We done? And he's eager to get out of there. We don't have any evidence that he's holding something from us, but his behavior gives us every reason to doubt that he's telling the truth. I think you know where the ring came from, and I think you're going to tell me. Okay. I bought it years ago. 
I carried a torch for Celine in those days. Guess I always have. Her old man never knew about it. And there it is, straight from the horse's mouth. McCall has been fanning the flame of his affection for her all of these years, and the husband knows nothing about it. He gave her the ring, the ring that was stolen. Could it be that he killed her because she refused to return his affections? And maybe he thought that the ring was his property and he was just going to take it back. A plausible theory. But before we start accusing him without any evidence, we can try to get him to talk a bit more about her husband. You know the husband? Sure I know Jacob. He was in the Corps. He met Celine on a furlough and married her when the war was finished. He put up with a load of shit. Do you think he killed his wife? No. No, not in my opinion. Ah, well, his behavior here kind of throws our last theory in the water. He just admitted that Celine's behavior has put her husband through hell. That's not really the responsive guy who's still doe-eyed over a woman. And he jumped right to the defense of her husband. You'd think that if he murdered her, he'd want to point the blame on the husband, the husband that took her away from him. But he doesn't. And yet his behavior is still perplexing. He's not quite as nervous as he was before, but he adamantly refuses to make eye contact with Cole. He's practically staring at Cole's chest, or sometimes off and to the left. He fidgets nervously in his seat, and every now and then he gulps. And what a gulp! I can practically hear the fluid traveling down his throat. We may not have any evidence that he's a killer at this point, but he's clearly not telling the truth, and so we can doubt his story. So if it wasn't Jacob, then you probably let her out of here with the guy who killed her. How do you feel about that? Stow the attitude, will ya? I tried to get on to Jacob. I rang him up, asked him to come pick her up like usual, but he refused. And she picked some night to push him over the edge. I rang him back around 11.30, but I got no answer. Thanks, Mr. McColl. You've been a big help. One more thing. Would you have an address for Celine? 142 North Union Avenue. God knows I had to send her home in enough cabs to remember that. And the man has her address memorized. In love with a married woman for all those years. But we're starting to get enough evidence that causes us to be suspicious of the husband. McCoy here called him twice, and the second time he didn't pick up the phone. Let's get out of here. Hey, what's the hurry? My stool was just starting to warm up nicely. Why didn't he pick up the phone at 11.30 at night? Well, we've got a license plate. We need to call it in to R&I. Operator, give me R&I. Putting you through now. Phelps, one, two, four, seven. How can I help, detective? I need a registered owner on a license plate, two boy, eight, eight, nine, nine. Yes, detective. I'll need to contact the DMV. Shall I relay the details via KGPL? Please. Thanks for your help. While R&I works on the plate, we can have a chat with the husband. Heading on over to the car, we can plan a trip to Celine Henry's home. You find the booze helps you get through a working day? Sharpens my investigatory instincts, folks. A smart lawyer might use that to throw out anything you collect today. A smart man might know it's unwise to stand between the patient and his medicine. As long as you're not falling over, Rusty, I'll let it slide. <laughs> That's mighty kind of you, Phelps. You know, you picked the wrong job if a healthy thirst offends you, Cole. We owe it to this city to do the best we can in this position. As homicide detectives, that responsibility is all the more serious. Always the politician. It's not political, it's practical. Maybe the men combing Hollywood Boulevard after the Elizabeth Short murder were more interested in sniffing out booze than the clues that would have led to her killer. Yeah, well, if only you'd been there, choir boy. Betty Short would be alive, the Japs would have spared Pearl Harbor, our ancestors wouldn't have tasted the forbidden fruit. Minor syntactical error, Detective Galloway. I never claimed to be able to prevent crimes. I only suggested a proficiency in solving them. Guess that's the drink slowing you down. Oh my god, brother, oh brother. It's worse than I could ever have imagined. <laughs> oh, they're gonna get along like a house on fire, aren't they? <laughs> Well, I can't wait to see that relationship develop. At any rate, Cole and Galloway arrive at the Henry residence at 10.09 in the morning. But knocking on the front door...
I'll try the back door. Wait here a second. Despite his penchant for the glass, Galloway leaps right into action. He heads in around behind the building while Cole peers in through the window. And immediately, Galloway spots evidence of foul play. The back window has been broken. But the coast is clear. So putting away his weapon, Galloway opens the front door for Phelps. Side window's been jimmied. Looks like somebody's creeped the joint. Someone beat us here, but who? Her husband? Why would her husband wreck their own home? And why would we not find him in it? Or was it the murderer? And if the murderer isn't Mr. Henry, what did he do with Mr. Henry? While exploring the house, we find a newspaper on the ground. Family burnt to death. Cops say house fire deaths are suspicious. Husband, wife, two young children killed. You said I had to go back, doctor. The fires are cathartic. They allow you to confront your past. You said the house would be empty. Are you taking the medication I have prescribed? You said the house would be empty. I heard them screaming. The circumstances were unfortunate. My colleagues had made all the necessary arrangements. You said the house would be empty. You're killing me! The deaths were unfortunate, but you have dealt with death before. I want you to come to the clinic and we can deal with it. You said the house would be empty! How can I find peace? Oh my god. That was Dr. Harlan Fontaine, the doctor whom Courtney Sheldon asked to help his friend. But here we find this same doctor using mentally ill people to burn down houses? But why? We'll find the answers to these questions in a future episode. But for now, we have to solve the red lipstick murder. And our task is to explore this house for clues. We don't find anything in the living room. Moving on to the kitchen, we see what remains of a poker game on the kitchen table. Lots of beer bottles, but not much there. Though on the floor, bathed in sunlight from a window, we find a woman's shoe. Size nines. Above average for a lady. It's a size nine high heel. Could this have belonged to Celine? We didn't find her shoes or any clothes at the crime scene. But if this is her shoe, why is it here? Why is it alone? Why is it by a window and not in a bedroom? Is it part of a spare set? Or was she wearing it on the night she was murdered? And if so, how did it get here? Or could it belong to the murderer? Could the murderer be a woman? But then, no, we recall that the shoe print at the crime scene was a size 8, and this is a size 9. But wait a minute. If we convert a man's size to a woman's size, a size 8 in men's is a size 9 and a half in women's. Does that mean anything? Did the killer dress up as a woman? Perhaps as Mrs. Henry herself? If so, for what purpose? And why did he come here? To find the answer, we keep exploring. Moving into the kitchen, we see the kitchen in complete disarray, food rotting on the counter and plates piled up in the sink. Here we can examine the glass. Burglar used a pry bar. Why did you kick the door in? You think I'm gonna climb through a broken window in a $30 suit? You got another thing coming, Buster. The glass lies on the kitchen floor, which means it was knocked out from outside. Someone used this window to gain entry. But for what purpose? To our knowledge, Celine was not at home when she was kidnapped. She was last seen at the club, getting in the car of a strange man. Was that man the murderer? Did he murder her and then come back to her house? But if so, to retrieve what? And why would he leave one of her shoes behind? Turning around, we see a note taped to the refrigerator door. Celine and Jacob are obviously having problems. It speaks to motive. Crime scene evidence still weighs against it being the husband, but Jacob could give us something to go on. If you sober up, you can find me at apartment 2, 1050 Huntley Drive. Telephone number MI2221. Jacob. So they were separated? Or in the middle of a separation? Because he was fed up with her drinking. 
At last, that comment from McCoy begins to make sense. Celine put Jacob through hell because of her drinking. One of my exes drank like this, you'd be feeling the back of my hand. Call in burglary and get technical services out here. I'll talk to the neighbors. Don't take all day about it, Phelps. I'll get nasty when I'm thirsty. We'll canvas the neighbors, but before we do, let's finish examining this house. We see a laundry room, but nothing much in it. Galloway, homicide, badge number 564. Requesting technical services for a suspected 459 at 142 North Union. So moving down the hall, we can enter the bedroom. And man, this place is an utter mess. Was this done by the burglar? Or is this how Mrs. Henry kept house? Wading through this filth, we can move on over to the dresser, where we find a jewelry box. Tiffany, the rest of this stuff is junk. Might explain the missing ring. So the Henry family was not well-to-do, but the ring that McCoy gave to Celine was valuable. And it's the only thing missing. But could the ring be the sole motive for the murder? Putting the empty box down, we can examine a framed photo on the dresser. A regular Amelia Earhart in her day. The ring looks distinctive. And in her youth, she was an adventurous woman. She was a pilot. Her plane was called the Red Hawk. But she's not flying anymore, and she's clearly not living in wealth or luxury. Could her fall from such a great height be the reason that she has taken to the bottle? But that's all the clues we find in the house. So with her house explored, we can begin to canvas the neighbors. Just as we begin, a neighbor pulls into her drive. She gets out of the car, but before she can head inside, we can hop out and try to talk to her. I knew it wasn't safe around here anymore. LAPD. Are you acquainted with Celine Henry, Miss... Horgan! Jennifer Horgan! I've known Celine for more than ten years. Our children grew up together. What's going on, officer? Did you see Mrs. Henry go out last night? Well, I'm no busybody, you understand, but... Celine had been drinking. And she and poor, long-suffering Jacob had a terrible row. I think Jacob may have given her a black eye. He stormed out and she went back inside. Did he come back? No. Celine was listening to music and shouting until she left around 10 p.m. She was very drunk to have been driving. But she is not the sort of person you can stop from doing something when her dander is up. What is this about, officer? Is Celine all right? I'm afraid Mrs. Henry has been murdered, ma'am. Murdered? Oh, my God. I'm afraid I need to go and then sit down. And the story just gets more complicated. But now we know why she has this life. She became a mother. She gave away flying to raise her children, but now that her children are grown and out of the house, all she has is to stare at the same boring man day in and day out. Let's see what Jacob has to say for himself. I don't think Jacob is our man, but we should see what he has to say. A man who can't provide her the same excitement she was used to in her youth. Jacob Henry had a violent argument with his wife last night. He's looking more and more likely. Uh, for my money, if the broad keeps the house looking like that, she probably deserved it. The skipper says bring him in and keep the hacks off our backs for a while. Fine by me. So it ain't the werewolf killer after all. Good to see you've come to your senses, Cole. I always said work the evidence. I only stipulated a connection to the BD killer as an avenue of investigation we should leave open. And as far as I'm concerned, it still is. Galloway seems convinced of Jacob's innocence, but he is our only lead at this point, and so we'll head that way. Okay, Phelps, we go in hard. You follow my lead. We arrive at 10.54 a.m. Galloway is expecting violence, and so we enter, gun drawn. And then, without even knocking... You Jacob Henry? Yeah. Who's asking? LAPD. You're under arrest for the murder of your wife, Celine Henry. Murder? Celine? Save the dramatics Oh my God! RKO, pal. You got bigger problems. What the hell are you talking about? You you come in here, you you tell me that Celine is... Take a seat, Mr. Henry. she's... We're going to have a look around, then we'll talk. Jesus, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Jacob seemed genuinely gutted upon hearing that news. Galloway certainly didn't deliver it with any tact. I get even the slightest hint that you're a flight risk, pal. We find a book on a nearby table. The Alcoholism Illness. Incidental, 
You think the atmosphere's thick in here? Wait till you try the gas chamber. Why would this man be trying to understand alcoholism as a disease if he was just planning on leaving his wife? Or worse yet, murdering her? Why even bother to try and understand the problem so you can fix it? He'll be back in a moment. Just sit tight. Moving into the kitchen. Despite the boxes everywhere, he's a sight tidier than his wife. Heading on over to the phone, we see a blank notepad lying on a counter. Maybe we can use an old police trick to see what was written. Scraping the lead ever so gently... ...reveals a message. Thanks for the offer. I need you to do something about my wife. The oldest problem there is. What to do about the old lady. And there we have it. Hard evidence that Jacob was plotting against his wife. Who did he call? Was it a friend? A hitman? Or was it the owner of the bar? McCoy. Could the two of them have been conspiring? And then on the ground nearby, we find a baseball bat. Optimistic, Cole. But it's not covered in blood. Is this the murder weapon we are looking for? I suppose it could have been cleaned, but we can't keep it as a clue, so it must not be the murder weapon that we are looking for. Moving into his bedroom, we see that we caught him in the middle of unpacking. Or was he packing to leave? In his suitcase, we find a pair of shoes. Size 11s. Oh, but wait a minute, these are size 11s. Taking a look at our notebook, we can scroll down until we find the shoe prints at the murder scene, and those were size 8s. But these are size 11s. That's a big difference. But then again, we found a note where Jacob was trying to find someone else to do something about his wife. So the fact that Jacob wears size 11s doesn't mean he's not involved in the death of his wife. That's it for the clues in his house. Moving into the living room, we can interrogate Jacob Henry. We'll start by asking him if he knows where his wife went last night. So who could have killed Celine? Where did she go last night, Jacob? A bar, I suppose. Look, I don't know. Oh, I don't know, officer. Well, we realize immediately that Jacob isn't really a crafty liar. He knows something he's not telling. He averted his gaze and then quickly and abruptly moved his head to look at Cole, almost as if he realized what he was doing and he didn't want to give himself away. But even after looking at Cole, he still bobs his head around nervously. But despite all of this, we have evidence that he knows exactly where his wife went last night. You know where she went, Jacob. You're lying. Why would I help you if you keep lying to me? Look, I'm telling you, I don't... No. He couldn't even look Cole in the eyes when he said that. But we know he's lying, and we have two pieces of evidence that can prove it. The first is the Bomba Club lighter we found near the crime scene. Celine obviously took this from the Bomba Club. And if she took it a long time ago and has been using it ever since, then Jacob, her husband, has likely seen her using it. In which case he would have seen the words Bomba Club written inside. But that's not even the best piece of evidence we have. We have witness testimony that the club owner, McCall, personally called Jacob to ask him to come pick up his wife at the Bomba Club. We can use either of these two pieces of evidence. We know she went to the Bomba Club. <sighs> the bartender there, he, he calls me if things are getting out of hand and I go and I bring her home. He called me last night. I said no. Phone rang a couple more times after that. I ignored it. I'm gonna have to live with that. The thing with bad liars is they can't hide a lie and they can't hide the truth. If this man was acting, pretending to be cut up over the death of his wife, why would he act so convincingly here, but so poorly when lying earlier? That sounded like the genuine broken sobs of a remorseful man. Remorseful that he didn't go pick up his wife. 
we can ask him what his last contact was with his wife. When did you last see your wife, Mr. Henry? Last night. I went to see her. We talked. Things got a little out of hand. I left. Now his response here is strange. He makes eye contact with Cole, but like last time, he continues to bob his head around. Every now and then he puffs his lips as if he's gonna throw up. The problem is that we know he's telling the truth here. Based on his neighbor's eyewitness testimony, he really did show up to the house, and things really did get out of hand. So I think we can interpret his behavior here as him still trying to come to terms with what he just heard. We have to remember that he didn't know his wife was dead until Galloway said so. If, of course, he's not the killer. And if he's not the killer, then that means he's trying to come to terms with it right now while we're interrogating him. Perhaps that can explain his odd behavior here, but we know that he's telling the truth. You don't remember what time you last saw your wife alive? Look, I'm sorry. I left. Maybe 9 p.m. Might have been a little later, but... Right around 9 well, that corresponds with everything we heard. He left at 9, she turned on the radio, started making a ruckus, and then left at 10 to go to the Bomba Club. So far, his story is lining up. But maybe we can get something out of him if we presume that he's the murderer and see how he reacts. Why did you kill her, Jacob? Things will go better if you come clean about it. That's a lousy thing to say. I never gave up on my wife. Well, we've got some complicated things going on here. He said that he never gave up on his wife. That's not the same thing as saying that he didn't kill his wife, which was the question that we asked. Now, there is evidence in this house to suggest that he's telling the truth. The book, for example, which never counts as an actual piece of evidence in this case, but it is unique to this house. We don't find it elsewhere, and it's a book on how to understand alcoholism as an illness. That's not the book someone owns if he really has given up on his wife. That's a book you own if you haven't given up, and you're trying to understand the disease better so that you can help the person afflicted. That book is in this house. It belongs to this man. It gives us the impression that he does still care about his wife. And yet, at the same time, we have physical evidence that we can't ignore. The handwritten note by the phone, for example. Who was it that he asked to do something about his wife? And why would he ask someone to do that if he hadn't given up? And then we have his behavior here. It's more suspicious than anything we've seen from him so far. His head continues to bob this way and that, but now his eyes dart around the room. Maybe part of him had never given up on his wife, which is why he had the book, but another part of him was absolutely sick to death of her, which is why he moved out, and which is why he had to call someone else to take care of his wife. We don't really have evidence for something as nebulous as him having given up on his wife. But remember, the three alternate interrogative choices are good cop, bad cop, and accuse. If we think of lie here as instead accuse, then we have all the evidence we need to accuse him of trying to do something to his wife. I don't believe you, Jacob. I think you didn't have the guts to do it yourself, so you had someone else do it. You want to back that up with something, Big Mouth? Huh? And as evidence, we can point to the note. The note by the phone suggests you meant her harm. You want the truth? Truth is, I was sick to death of her. I was trying to have her committed. We're still going to need you to come downtown, Mr. Henry. We can get this all down on paper, Jacob. How you got fed up with your wife and how you figured killing her would bury all your troubles. Kill my own wife? She was a loss of the tramp, and you just couldn't stand it anymore. Shut your goddamn mouth. <laughs> so now you're going to tell me you loved her? Ah, the DA goes all gooey over remorse, Jacob. Ooh, and a cheap shot to Galloway. Though well, I have to admit, Galloway kind of deserved it there. But we can't let this man assault a police officer, and so we can teach him a thing or two with some good old-fashioned Marine Corps fisticuffs. <laughs> Oh. 
Call it in and get a squad car dispatched. And check for messages. I'll keep old Slugger here company. Well, Galloway seems to be taking it pretty well. No harm, no foul, I suppose. Heading into the kitchen, we can pick up the phone to call into dispatch. Operator, give me dispatch. Putting you through now. Phelps, badge 1247. How can I help, detective? I need a patrol unit to transport a suspect back to Central. Certainly, detective. You have a message from the coroner. Do you wish to be put through? Yes, ma'am. Carruthers. It's Phelps. I've completed the autopsy. Several wounds to the head from a blunt metal instrument. Closest match would be a socket wrench handle. So the cause of death was the blunt... No, the blows to the head, surprisingly, were not fatal. Death was from hemorrhage and shock from the fractured ribs and multiple injuries caused by the stomping. Anything else? He's some kind of sex fiend. The tissues of the anus were bruised about one-eighth of an inch, but no trace of semen in the anus, vagina, or stomach. Thanks, Doc. Operator, give me R&I. Any word on an owner for that vehicle? License was 2-boy-8899? Yes, Detective. The plate belongs to a brown 1936 Pontiac. Registered owner is one Alonzo Mendez of 402 South Fremont Street, apartment 16. Thanks. Any other messages? One, Detective. From Captain Donnelly. He wants any and all suspects returned to Central. Interviews to be set up immediately. Got it. We're coming in. So the cops take him into custody, and they found the owner of that license plate. Now that's too good of a lead to give up. And even though Jacob fought us here, we don't really have a whole lot of evidence that he killed his wife. But the captain wants Cole and Galloway to head to Central and start an interrogation first. And so that is where we'll go. Thank you for listening to... Carruthers said she took a real pounding. Maybe if he had been a little firmer in the beginning, he wouldn't be in this situation now. I imagine that Neanderthal routine is a big hit with the ladies, Galloway. Women love me, Phelps. I have no complexity. They know exactly what they're going to get. Though wouldn't that be boring? I'm not going to pretend to be able to read the minds of all women, but don't women want a bit of spontaneity in their lives? To be able to predict a man's actions day in and day out faithfully would get a bit tiresome, don't you think? At any rate, Cole and Galloway arrive at Central, and the first thing Cole does is to try to explain to the captain that they have another lead. We have a firm lead, Captain. Are you questioning my judgment, Cole Phelps? No, sir. Good. I thought not. Jacob Henry is a sub-sister pushed around by his wife. I think with the right kind of persuasion, he might be prepared to seek absolution. Are you prepared to show him the error of his ways, young Phelps? I don't think he's our man. Galloway agrees with me. Don't drag me into this. Rusty is a practical policeman. A bird in hand is always worth two in the bush. Let's liberate a confession from poor Jacob and the public will sleep easier tonight. Run along now, folks. I've warmed them up nicely for you. And despite Cole's protests, and the fact that neither Cole nor Galloway think it was Jacob, the captain forces us to go inside to get a confession. Doesn't look good, Jacob. You're in a big jam here. You lie to me, and I can't help you out. Do you understand me? Yes. Now, our goal here with this interview is very different from the interviews we've had in the past. In the past, our goal with the interrogation has been to suss out the truth instead of the truth we're trying to get him to confess. And so our toolkit is going to be very different. For this interrogation, we need to ignore the truth, doubt, and lie options, and instead think of them as good cop, bad cop, and accuse. We're going to use those tactics as a way to coerce a confession from Jacob Henry. And we'll start by asking him whether or not he has access to the type of weapon used to kill his wife. What do you do for work, Jacob? I'm a mechanic. Engines, differentials, transmissions, that kind of stuff. So you have access to tools? Yes, I do. Your wife was brutally beaten with a socket wrench handle, then stomped to death. How do you think that looks, Jacob? I I was home in bed. (laughs) Again, this guy isn't very sly. He's 
telling us an obvious lie here. It's clear by his behavior that he is hiding something from us. But we don't have evidence that he wasn't in bed sleeping last night, so the best we can do is to use the evidence we have to try and accuse him of not being home last night. You're full of shit, Jacob. The truth is you hated that bitch. You followed her and dragged her into the car and then took her out to the moors. She woke up and you smashed her face in with a sock and No. No, 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 no. And then you stomped no. her. No. You stomped her because she's a drunken whore and she treated you like shit. You stomped her for all the years you had to take it. You stomped her because you are such a weak fucking sister, Jacob, and you wanted to erase all memory of it. Go on. Try to deny it. I was at home. I should have gone to her at the bar, but I didn't. You can't prove I wasn't home. Gee, many crickets. Cole can be brutal, man. Well, he's right. We can't prove that he wasn't home, but we do know that he was home just after 10 o'clock when his wife arrived at the Bomba Club and McCall called him to come take her home. He picked up that call and refused to do so. Then when McCall called again around 1130, Jacob didn't answer the phone. He could have not answered the phone because he was sitting at home angry at his wife and he just didn't want to go pick her up. And so he ignored the call or he could have not answered the phone because he wasn't home. And that's the argument we'll use to accuse him. I can. The bar owner, McCall, gave you up. He called your house right at the time that someone was smashing Celine's skull in and got no answer. If we find that socket wrench, you're going to fry. Get it off your chest. Tell me you killed her. I killed her, all right. I killed her dreams. She was an aviator. Famous in her day, flying around up there like a bird. But she never wanted to come back down. You know, my pop was a sod farmer, dirt poor. I joined the Corps, trained to be a mechanic. I did better than my father did. I worked hard for it. That's all you can ask of a man. But Celine, she never wanted to come down from the clouds. She wanted everything I couldn't give her. All I had was security. That was never going to be enough. Oh, man, and we fail. We successfully complete this question. We got the truth out of him, but we didn't get him to confess. And if anything, his response here gives us more of an indication that he's not guilty. The poor guy. But we have three more chances. Next, we can try to get him by somehow trying to tie him in with the markings we found on her body. You did it. Everything points to you. What does text mean, Jacob? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, he doesn't know what we're talking about. He sits here confused, dejected about this whole thing, gutted that she died before they could repair their marriage. He's not maintaining eye contact with Cole, but his body language is that of a man who's heartbroken and filled with regret, rather than a man who's trying to hide something. Since accusing him of a crime didn't really work last time, right now we can try playing the good cop. Please believe me, I didn't kill my wife. I need a reason to believe you, Jacob. You want a confession? That's what you want? That's exactly what we want. Seems to me there are two types of marriages. First, where the couple love each other equally and everything's roses. And then there's the other. Where one person loves the other more than life itself and always puts them first. Chumps like me. Love them no matter what, no matter how badly they behave. That's it. That's my confession. I love my wife. And I'll take any test you got to prove it. And again, a swing and a miss. We successfully get the truth out of him. But that truth is not a murder confession. Captain isn't gonna like this. But at least now we begin to better understand why he just appears to be so heartbroken over this entire thing. Despite his wife's alcoholism, and despite moving out of that house, he still loved her. But wait a minute. We talked with a neighbor and that neighbor said that he hit her. You don't hit your wife if you love her. Maybe he is full of crap. We can talk with him about it. Your marriage was over. You took her in and she threw it back in your face. You didn't go over there to hurt her. It just got out of hand. It's not how it was. Ah, but we have evidence that things did get violent. 
You're lying, Jacob. It was falling apart and things got violent. I'm not lying. I'm telling you how it was. And as evidence, we can point to the witness testimony we got from his neighbor about the black eye he gave to his wife. Jenny Horgan says you blackened her eye. It's all right, Jacob. The DA will understand. In your shoes, I would have done exactly the same thing. I hit her. All right? I'm not proud of it, but she was coming at me with a frying pan. What would you do? I took it for years, but sometimes a man can only take so much. Oh, and she tried to assault him first? Again, we get this question right, but we don't get a confession. And we lose our ability to paint this guy as a violent man. I mean, yeah, he did end up hitting her. But could a lawyer not say that it was in self-defense if she was racing after him with a frying pan of all things? And to have put up with it for so many years, as both he and his neighbor said that he did without lifting a finger against her, gives us the impression that he's not really a violent man. That's three down and no confession. But perhaps we can get one if we talk about her missing jewelry. Why did you break into your wife's house, Jacob? Why steal the ring? What? What are you talking about? I've got a key. Why would I need to break in? Ah, that's a good point. It's clear he does have a key. He is looking cool, calm, and collected, meeting eyes with coal. We don't have any indication that he's lying. Plus, if he has the key, we can prove it by simply searching his house or finding it on his person. So it would be a stupid thing for him to lie about if we wouldn't be able to find the key. So he's got a key. So how did the window get broken? Who broke the window? Why was the place trashed? and the glass was on the inside of the house. If he did trash the house to make it look like a burglary, do we think that this man has the wits to then go outside of the house and knock the glass inward to make the theft more convincing? We're having a hard time explaining the break-in, but I think we can explain why he would take the ring, and that's because he knew who it came from. You took the ring because you found out who gave it to her. What are you talking about? Her prized garnet ring, given to her by her old boyfriend, Dick McCall. I never knew that. I lived with that woman for three years, and I never knew that. In that case, I think you should be talking to Dick McCall. We'll do the detective work, Lunkhead. Just answer the questions. I'll see what I can do for you, Jacob. But I'm not promising. It still looks bad for you. Phelps, you failed me, son. We have another lead, Captain. This guy Mendez could be our man. I hope so, Phelps. I really hope so. I'm deeply disturbed by your style of police work. Well, come on, what do you want us to do? If he didn't murder the woman, we can't force him to confess. Gosh, it's all about numbers and heads and cells and headlines with these guys. We can still pull down a conviction for the skipper if we chase down this Mendez guy. But at least now we can go and follow up on Mendez. Alonzo Mendez. Sound like a man who moonlights as the werewolf? Don't sound like a man I'd let my daughter anywhere near. You've got a daughter. Spend enough time drinking, Cole, you'll find yourself with any number of things you don't want when you're sober. So that's why you never sober up. Exactly. We arrive at Mendez's apartment at 11.26 a.m. Before heading inside, we can find Mendez's apartment number by taking a look at the mailboxes. Mendez, apartment 16. Apartment 16. Heading inside, we can try and find an elevator. Oh, come on. Tell me there's an elevator now. Great. Well, which floor are we running to? Heading over to the stairwell, we see a floor map on the wall. Here. The apartment's up on the top floor. Oh, man, we got to run all the way to the top floor. So, running up and passing floors two, three, we arrive at floor four. And we see that apartment 16 is at the very end of this hallway. Don't bother knocking. Just kick the door in. Uh, why? Take a look around and see what you can find. I wonder how he knew that we would not find Mendez here. At any rate, he is not in the apartment. So we can look around, see if we can find anything. The living room is a bit untidy. Clearly the habitation of a bachelor, but nothing too grotesque. In the dining room, we find a small table and a tray of alcoholic beverages nearby. Moving into the kitchen, we don't really see anything. So heading down the hallway, we can try and find a bedroom. We find the bedroom to the left. And inside the bedroom, we find more clothing everywhere. Ooh, and what's that? 
Moving towards the bed, we see a shoe on the ground. Gotta get these to Ray. Size eights could help place Mendez at the scene. And looky here, size eights. And they're covered in mud and dirt. A perfect match. Though we do only find one of them. Where's the other shoe? Ooh, and what's that? A bloody box on the ground. If that's not hard evidence, I don't know what is, but... Oh, and wait a minute. Moving over towards the box. It's right by this open window. Why is this window open? Oh, well, wait a minute. Walking over to the dresser, we see... A gun! Not much help. Why would the murderer use the blunt instrument when he has a gun? I suppose it could have been a murder of opportunity and he didn't have the gun on him at the time. But this box is really close to this open window. Why is it so close to this open window? And why would Mendez leave for work with his window open? That's gonna bother me. Inspecting the box... Consistent with Celine's injuries, and the blood can be typed. We find this blunt instrument. Looks like some kind of socket wrench. And right next to it is... What do you know? Brothers could match the color and brand of the body. Classic Carmine. The same brand used by the victim. We have the murder weapon. We better get Pinker down here. Why keep it? Why not throw it away? Think these clowns are geniuses? Thank your stars you caught a break and Captain Donald would begin to like you. Hey! What gives? LAPD, you're under arrest. Do not lose that son of a bitch! I'll go get our wheels. Mendez, stop right there. Why do they always shout, LAPD, don't move, when the criminal is far enough away to make a run for it? Why not move closer first, engage the guy in conversation, before giving him a reason to run? Ah, it's always bothered me. Anyway, we gotta chase after this guy now. He leads Cole onto the rooftop, and then leaps from rooftop to rooftop, navigating through the urban sprawl of downtown Los Angeles. Eventually, he uses a drain pipe to reach the bottom. And crossing a busy street, he gets into a car. This then becomes a car chase. Get in and drive. God damn it, get after him, Cole. Hit him. Clean this asshole off the road. I didn't do that. That was the criminal. <laughs> I did not run over that person. I got an idea. Get him next to my window, Cole. Keep me alongside his vehicle and I'll stop the son of a bitch. Phelps, you gotta get me closer. Hit him, Cole! Spin him out! Keep it steady and I'll try to bust his tires! I hope you get the death penalty! Heading out of the car, we could race forward to make an arrest. What the You're under arrest for the murder of Celine Henry. Oh dear! Hands behind your head! I ain't saying a goddamn thing. You did a grand job, lads. Phelps, that's quite a way to acquit yourself in your first outing as a homicide investigator. It seems the city has a new and vengeful guardian. Considering the evidence against your suspect, and the thoroughness with which a report was compiled, I foresee a safe passage through the courts, and the DA agrees with me. Brutality on a scale such as this deserves retribution. The people and the press of this city demand it. And so we solve the red lipstick murder. Or do we? We cleared the husband, we arrested the culprit, but we don't have a motive. Why did Mendez kill Celine? 
Yes, he had opportunity. McCoy saw her driving away with him that night. But did he have the means? We don't know where that socket wrench came from. We don't know what Mendez's job was. How did he get the socket wrench? Did he happen to have one on hand? Did he pick one up at a shop with the express purpose of murdering Celine? Why didn't he use his gun? And what was his motive? Was it a sex thing or was it purely greed? Carruthers said that whomever killed him was some sort of degenerate, based on the marks he found on the body. Maybe this was just some late night liaison that went wrong. Maybe she began to sober up and come to her senses and she began to say no. And Mendez didn't like hearing her say no. And so he killed her and then did horrible things to her corpse and then saw the ring and said, I could hawk this for some money and ripped it off her finger. Sure, I suppose that could have happened, but in this case, we don't find any evidence for any of that. Where's the ring? We didn't find it at his house. We didn't find it on his person. Did he already pawn it? Where did it go? And without that ring, we're missing a huge clue in this case that could convict him. All we find that connects Mendez to the crime is the box of bloody clothes with the murder weapon and the lipstick, which are all conveniently by an open window in his apartment. Why was that window open? It's gonna bother me, and I'm sure it will bother you until we get the answers we need in an upcoming episode. This was the first case on the Homicide Desk, and all of the homicide cases are connected in one way or another. We'll find answers to the questions raised in this episode in future episodes. I publish many videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss the next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My shirts come in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. They also come on other products as well, smartphone cases, mugs, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with brand new videos.